let us worship our God. I invite you to stand if you're able. As we all stand in our hearts in reverence to the Lord as He calls us into His presence this morning from Psalm 66. Uh, Psalm 66 is written to the choir master. It's a song. It's a psalm. Shout for joy to God all the earth. Sing the glory of His name. Give to Him glorious praise. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies come cringing to you. All the earth worships you and sings praises to you. They sing praises to your name, Selah. Let us pray and ask the Lord to help us as we ascend the mount and come into his presence this morning. O oh Lord, our glorious and gracious triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit, we thank you for the opportunity to gather with you. We thank you for this morning's corporate worship, even as we look forward to this evening, on this day that you've given to us. Lord, we come to sing praises to you. We come to lift up our hearts in worship. And we ask that you would help us to do just that, and that you would be at work amongst us. Come and be with us, our covenant faithful God. Your presence as we enjoy the fellowship we have with one another. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, let us sing. So we put our voices together singing How Firm a Foundation. You'll find it on page 7 in your order of service. Please be seated. Let us go and humbly confess our sins to our gracious God together. Most holy and merciful God, who is searched and knows us, you alone are acquainted with all our ways. We confess our failure to love you with our entire being to keep your holy law, 
and to be salt and light in this world. We have given in to many temptations and have not faithfully walked with the Spirit. We have not loved you above all and do not treat our neighbors as we want to be treated. In your great love and mercy, forgive our sins and remove the guilt and shame we bear. For the sake of your dear Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, Amen. Words assurance of pardon and forgiveness from John chapter 3, as we begin reading in verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already. Because he has not believed in the name. Well, having confessed our sins and heard the assurance of forgiveness from the Lord, we have the opportunity now to confess our faith together. Uh, we're going to be using the Apostles' Creed as we put our uh, voices together uh, with the voices of uh, those who've come before us and our brethren around the world. So, what is it, dear saints, that you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, as you remain seated, let's respond to that confession as we sing the doxology. Well, as we pray to give, let's pray. Ask for the Lord's help. Lord, our God, giver of all good things, we ask that you would now receive from us our gifts. Lord, we're, we're thankful that uh, whether it is through our giving online or our giving as we gather in person, that we have the opportunity uh, to give to you just a little bit of, uh, of what you've given to us to steward over. We ask that you would help us to be a generous people. That you would grant us hearts that are full of gratitude to you for all that we have. That we are content in the providence that you've brought. And Lord, that we would be diligent in pursuing the labors that are before us. We ask that you'd use these gifts and you'd bless them and that you would put them to use in your kingdom in ways that we can't even imagine, that you would bring forth great fruit from them, that you would provide for your church, that you'd use them for meeting the needs of those who are in need, and that you would 
continue to be about the work of gathering and making disciples. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's pray. Most gracious and almighty God, founder, builder, sustainer, and ruler of your church, oh Lord, let us continue to enjoy your covenant presence and your covenant blessings today and in the future more and more. We ask that the Spirit would be at work in your church, and especially we ask that the Spirit would be at work among us here at Christ Church. That your means of grace would be effectual word, prayer, and, and sacrament, and, and even the gathering and fellowship of the saints. That the Spirit would be at work, and, and we would see a powerful using of these things and the calling and gathering and equipping and the deploying and the perfecting of the saints. Lord, you promise to build your church, so we ask you now to build your church around the world, and especially, Lord, we ask that you build Christ church. You've promised to give gifts of elders and deacons to care for your church under the guidance of Christ, empowered by the, the work of the Spirit. And we ask for you to do that, O oh Lord, throughout your world, throughout your church. But we especially ask that you would do that here at Christ Church, that we might be given godly, faithful men to be our, our first elders and deacons as we move towards particularization. Lord, we pray. Lord, as we pray for, for these officers, these elders and the deacons that we so desire and look forward to welcoming, we pray for them and we pray that you would be at work amongst us. Lord, we pray as our forefathers prayed, as, as, as the reformers prayed, as elders have prayed, and as families and Christians and, and men and women and boys and girls have prayed throughout the generations. Lord, we ask that you would be at work amongst us at Christ Church, that we, just one small leaf on a branch of your greater church, that we might be a nursery for elders and deacons, that we might be a place where, where men would be brought, enjoying internships and apprenticeships and then deployed, Lord, we hope here in the greater Knoxville area and throughout East Tennessee through, through church planting. But Lord, we also pray. We pray for elders and deacons to be raised up from the young men that are amongst us, the young men that will come. Lord, that you might deploy these men all over the world. You might deploy them here in Knoxville, that they would be used by you for the proclamation of the gospel, the teaching of the word and the equipping of the saints. Lord, we pray not just for a nursery that would be about raising up elders and deacons, as wonderful a gift as that is, Lord, but we pray that this 
this church would be a place, it would be a nursery for all, that we might be equipped for the work of ministry. That we might see a picture of Titus 2 happening. So we pray for not only the young men, but for our young women as well. We pray for the old men and the old women. We pray for all of us, that you'd be at work amongst us, that we might see godly men and women serving and making disciples of Jesus Christ together here. Lord, we'll be looking at the last of the Beatitudes this morning together in your word, and we'll be looking at persecution Father, we do not ask for a perfect life this side of heaven, but we do ask that that you would keep your promises as we trust you will, that when persecution comes, that when we face trials and hardships, when temptations war against us, that you would come and, and be with us, that you would not leave us alone, that we would know your presence, that you would dwell amongst us, that you would go before us as our great shepherd, that you would raise your staff, that you would beat down and destroy the wolves that attack from without and the wolves that come up from within, that you would be our tender, loving, bold shepherd that would go after the one who has wandered and and return them and restore them in the power of your grace. Lord, in all this, we ask that as we face these things and as we live by faith, that you would be glorified in your church and that you would grow us, you'd sanctify us, you'd mature us, that we might have greater faith, stronger faith, rooted in Christ, that we might love you and your word and one another and our neighbors, and that our relationship with you would grow. Lord, we're thankful that you care for all the needs of your people, and we lift them up to you now. And we pray especially for those mothers amongst us who are carrying covenant children. We pray for those whose due dates are now. We ask, Lord, that you would be at work in bringing these covenant children to us safely, that we might rejoice with fathers and mothers and families. Lord, what a joy it is. What a wonderful, beautiful thing it is to see. Covenant children, the seed of the church, hearing the giggles and the, and the cries and the wiggles of the little ones. Oh, Lord, you are so kind to us. And we thank you for the goodness and grace that you show us. As we think of the blessings that you give to us and the care that you give to your people, We're reminded that you tell us to pray as well for the civil magistrate. It's clear from your word and just from reality that you alone are the king of kings. You created all things. You rule over history. You rule over the hearts of men and women, presidents, dictators, and kings. So we ask that you would make yourself known clearly to the civil servants in our own land. We ask that you might save and sanctify and sustain them. Lord, be at work amongst them. We we want wise leaders. We want humble leaders. Leaders who are bold and courageous for your truth, who understand what true justice is, who know what evil is, who know what goodness is. Leaders who have hearts of service, not those who would seek bribes or self-aggrandizement. Lord, we need not tribalism, we need not division, but we ask that you would come and bring revival and reformation through the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray for the civil servants, and we pray for, for all those in the different branches of the civil government We pray for the different levels, from the federal to the state to the county and the city. Lord, we pray for all those who serve in bureaucracies and in our military. We pray for the police forces and for the the fire. 
And Lord, amongst all of our neighbors who are serving in these ways, again, we pray for grace to be poured out upon them, and we pray that they, even as we pray it for ourselves, would grow in a a healthy, robust, good fear of you. And Lord, as we pray these things, we are left left with the, the confession and the prayer that we We cry out regularly, come quickly, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Even as we put our voices together now and pray as as you have taught us. Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we turn our attention to our continuous reading this morning, our Old Testament reading is in Numbers. uh, Numbers chapter 23 we've been uh, reading uh, recently uh, uh, about uh, King Balak seeking uh, the services of the sorcerer uh, Balaam. And we come now to Numbers chapter 23. We're going to start in in verse 1 and just read the first 12 verses together. We're going to see that uh, as this sorcerer uh, Balaam seeks counsel from the Lord, as he goes to him, he submits to God and not to this earthly king. And instead of cursing Israel, uh, he will do the opposite and bless them. So this is God's word. Uh, Follow along if you're in a pew Bible on page 123 or on your devices, and listen to God's Word, uh, Numbers 23, beginning in verse 1. And Balaam said to Balak, Build for me here seven altars, and prepare for me here seven bulls and seven rams. Balak did as Balaam had said, and Balak and Balaam offered on each altar a bull and a ram. And Balaam said to Balak, Stand beside your bull and Perhaps the Lord will come to meet me, and whatever he shows me, I will tell you. And he went to a bare height, and God met Balaam. And Balaam said to him, I have arranged the seven altars, and I have offered on each altar a bull and a ram. And the Lord put a word in Balaam's mouth and said, Return to Balak, and thus you shall speak. And he returned to him, and behold, he... And all the princes of Moab were standing against his burnt offering, beside his burnt offering. And Balaam took up his discourse and said, From Aram, Balak has brought me, the king of Moab from the eastern mountains. Come, curse Jacob for me, and come, denounce Israel. How can I curse whom God has not cursed? How can I denounce whom the Lord has not denounced? For from the top of the crags I see him, from the hills I behold him. Behold, a people dwelling alone and not counting itself among the nations. Who can count the dust of Jacob or number the fourth part of Israel? Let me die the death of the upright and let my end be like his. And Balak said to Balaam, What have you done to me? I took you to curse my enemies, and behold, you've done nothing but bless them. And he answered and said, Must I not take care to speak what the Lord puts in my mouth? We turn our attention to our our New Testament reading. We're almost to the end of Romans together. As we're moving through, uh, we are in uh, the second half of Romans chapter 15. And we read of uh, the wonderful way that uh, the Lord has used uh, Paul as his servant to proclaim uh, the gospel and the truth of his word to the Gentiles. Uh, A good reminder of uh, us sitting here hearing reading from Romans and how the Spirit is working amongst us, we trust, uh, we see how the Lord is still using Paul, even amongst the Gentiles. Praise Him, the Lord that is. So this is God's Word, Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15, we'll begin our reading in verse 14. I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to instruct one another. 
But on some points I have written to you very boldly by way of reminder because of the grace given me by God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In Christ Jesus, then, I have reason to be proud of my work for God. For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience, by word and deed, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around to Elysium, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ, and thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation, but as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. This is the reason why I have so often been hindered from coming to you. But now, since I no longer have any room for work in these regions, and since I have longed for many years to come to you, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain and to be helped on my journey there by you. Once I have enjoyed your company for a while. At present, however, I'm going to Jerusalem, bringing aid to the saints for Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make some contributions for the poor among the saints at Jerusalem. For they were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have come to share in their spiritual blessings, they ought also to be of service to them in material blessings. I completed this and have delivered to them what has been collected. I will leave for Spain by way of you. I know that when I come to you, I will come in the fullness of the blessing of Christ. I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf, that I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea, and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints, so that by God's will I may come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. May the God of peace be with you all. Amen. Well, having... Having heard God's word, we have the opportunity now to, to sing it and, and ministry to one another and in praise to God. So if you're able, let's stand as we all sing Psalm 91 together.
Amen. Please be seated. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, oh Lord, we ask that you would, would care for us now. We ask that the Spirit would be at work amongst us, that, that we would be fed as your sheep, your word, that our great shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ, would be lifted up and made clear to us that his name might be glorified. For it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Well, if you turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5, we're going to be looking at verses 10 through 12 together uh, this morning. And if you're using a, a pew Bible, uh, you'll find uh, that around page 760. You should be able to find Matthew chapter 5. Uh, and then I see a few folks tapping on devices. Might be a faster way to get there, depending guess on how fast your fingers are. Uh, we're continuing our time together in the Sermon on the Mount. We're concluding our time in the Beatitudes, uh, the introduction as it were, as Christ is, is moving into uh, the sermon. We're going to be looking at chapters 5 to, to 7 uh, with the reminder in the back of our, uh, of our minds as we're moving our way through of what uh, Pastor and Dr. Sinclair Ferguson has to say about this. He says it's not a sermon, but an ideal life and an ideal world, but it's about kingdom life in the fallen world. And that's again what we see as we come to the conclusion of the Beatitudes and continue to move our way through uh, the Sermon on the Mount together. So this is God's Word as we read uh, for the context in verse 2. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven." Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. We'll be, though we're remembering the context, keeping that in mind, we'll be focusing on those last few verses, uh, beginning uh, with Christ proclaiming this blessing upon those who are persecuted for righteousness. Having worked through the Beatitudes together over the last several weeks, uh, perhaps, maybe, you're surprised a little that Christ would come to the end of, of the Beatitudes as he's, he, he's talking about this, this, these aspects, these characteristics of, of the Christian, particularly in the kingdom life, these things that he's He's working amongst us. And then the, the conclusion as he comes to it is that, that Christians are blessed for being persecuted for his sake. Perhaps persecution wasn't where you might have been expecting as you were reading through for the first time the Beatitudes where, where Christ might uh, end. I imagine uh, as we remember the setting here, we've talked about it as Christ has brought his disciples up, and I'm sure that, that, that there were others that followed the, uh, the apostles as well, and, he, and he's moving his way through, he's describing these things, and, and then when he comes to, you know, blessed are those who are, who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, and he goes on and on. I mean, one might think that you might see a, a few folks doing the, the, the Homer Simpson gif, where they just start kind of slowly backing away, and they're like, I don't know about this persecution thing. That's not what I was expecting. But sadly, we have seen consistently, we see in the scriptures persecution. We see it in the Old Testament, even as we see there how the, the uh, prophets themselves were persecuted by God's people. But then we look at church history moving forward. Uh, we see in the New Testament that persecution has been a reality for uh, the church. Persecution is 
a reality for Christians today. It's a reality for Christians around the world, particularly more so for for our brethren around uh, the world. And, and in fact, if you go to uh, groups like opendoors.org and others that try to track persecution and keep up with these things that we might know as the church how best to pray, how best to help our brothers and sisters around the world that are facing these things, that they have, have tracked and seen that we have had a great escalation, an explosion in persecution in the year 2023 particularly. And persecution is perhaps at its highest point ever uh, with the amount of Christians that are suffering under it. Now, they don't know all the numbers perfectly because it's hard to know around the world everyone who's dealing with this, but, but the accurate guesstimate that they, they have is that one in seven Christians in the world, 365 million Christians right now, or at least in 2023, uh, were seeing heavy, high levels of persecution for their faith in Lord Jesus Christ. 300,000 Christians in 2023 were displaced from their homes because of persecution. 15,000 Christian properties, whether that's churches or uh, Christian schools or Christian hospitals around the world were attacked in 2023 alone. 2023, at least that they know of, they have records of about 5,000 Christians that were specifically murdered in persecution as martyrs for the faith and for the Lord Jesus Christ. In China, the policy for all official churches and supposed to be for any gathering of Christians is they must have a sign and the sign must read, love the communist, love the religion. There's one province in China uh, that actually requires Christians, if they want to attend worship, the law is you must download an app on your phone. And before you go to any Christian service, you must log in and, and make a note to that just to let the benevolent overlords aware that you are going to go worship the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So persecution, persecution is happening, sadly. And we are beginning to see, I think, a little bit of it in the West, particularly here. Uh, in the United States, we've, we've been blessed with somewhat of a bubble where there wasn't persecution, there wasn't uh, the, the reviling from the world that came as strong as it has been in the past in other places, but the bubble's burst. We've moved beyond that. And some of this is legal persecution. I think mainly what we're seeing, though, is a move towards um, persecution that causes Christians to, to lose out on opportunities, causes Christians to be reviled, mocked, uh, friendships to end or, or perhaps uh, exclusion from social settings. Uh, families are beginning to split. There's silencing, folks losing jobs or just not being considered for jobs because of their faith. And U.S. Christians, as I mentioned, they've enjoyed this, this bubble to stay away from these things, but, but, but it's coming. It's begun. And then we shouldn't be scared. I mean, I, it's a little unsettling when you think about it, particularly, I mean, I have children. Last thing I want to think about is the fact that things will be different, harder. Uh, but I hope by the time we get to the end of our, our sermon that we might be somewhat uh, encouraged, not fearful. Because what we see is the reality and the promise that persecution comes to the church, and we're going to work through that a little bit. Uh, but what we also see is that persecution usually... As it grows, it's because God is growing his kingdom. Persecution grows and advances because the church is being built. So yes, 2023 saw the highest level of persecution, but you know what else is going on right now? We see the highest, biggest, largest numbers of Christians in the world. There are places in the world that there are mighty movements happening where God is saving and building his church. For us, we're here in the West, in America, in Tennessee, and in we're seeing somewhat of the opposite. But the reality is worldwide, the church is exploding. And so, yes, persecution is responding to that. Uh, but in the midst of it, we see the Lord is at work. That was a long introduction. Uh, we'll spend a, a few more minutes moving through uh, these couple of verses. And, and what I want us to see is, Christian, rejoice when you face persecution, for Jesus guarantees your reward. Rejoice, Christian, when you face persecution, 
for Jesus guarantees your reward. And we're going to look at three things together in the few moments we have left. The reward of persecution, the reality of persecution, the response to persecution. So reward, reality, and response. We start first with this, this reward of persecution, primarily looking at verse 10 here uh, in our few verses. You know, a reward of persecution is uh, the opportunity to share in the sufferings of Christ. We read of that in, in 1 Peter 4 and Philippians 3, that there's an aspect uh, that we get the joy of participating in the suffering of our Savior. That, that we don't just look upon and read of uh, the humiliation and suffering that our Savior went through uh, in His work of redeeming His bride. That the cross came before the crown, but that we, by God's grace and perfect wisdom and providence have the opportunity to share in that as well and help us to appreciate greater the love that Christ has for us. We see a reward of persecution uh, for the sake of Jesus is the truth that testifies to the reality that when we're persecuted for our faithful proclamation of Christ, it testifies to the fact that there are others who see God at work in us. Maybe that's kind of a scary thing, but think of it in a, a sillier way. If you proclaim to be the sports fan of a certain team, and when the other teams see it, they, 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 they poke at you and, and, and they, they mess with you a little bit, in a greater, more important cosmic scale, we have placed upon us the mark of our God as his adopted children, and that is seen and it's testified by the reality that persecution comes when we are persecuted for the sake of Christ. So it is another way that that, that truth is testified to. A reward of persecution is enjoying, as God's adopted uh, children, the blessing of our loving Heavenly Father as He cares for us and looks after us. And we look back to verse 10 particularly. I think we can't miss the fact that it begins just like the rest of the Beatitudes brought together blessed, talking about this blessed state, the blessing that comes to God's people. And one of the things that, again, we can't miss right there in verse 10, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's where we started, wasn't it? We started with blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So it's talking about that reality of this is, the kingdom of heaven is possessed, is had, by God's people. So again, we see the, the reward of the reality and the truth of, of who we are in Christ. You know, I mentioned um, some of the things about China a moment ago and, and what's happening there, and the persecution is so high. And, and I think one of the reasons why the pers persecution is so high when I've talked to some, some Chinese Christians who are in China, uh, it's because the Chinese people are... We don't quite understand it. We think of them as this massive country, but they are just like the rest of the world in many places in the midst of beginning and falling off the precipice of a huge implosion of their population. They did a little too good of a job of controlling the birth rate, and so now it's really bad. And some of these Christians have told me in China that when you see families that have children, you literally have about a 90% chance that those are Christians. The Christians are the only people who are getting married, have hope, having children, and they're the most persecuted in all the country. And he simply, these Christians, they've reported to me, what they've said is, we're praying, we're being faithful, we're about a generation away that we're going to wake up and our kids are going to be the majority. There are not going to be a revolution, we're not going to have to have a war, we're just going to wake up. There's going to be more Christians than there are unbelievers, and you're going to see the world change. It's amazing how God works. We've seen it before. He's flipped empires upside down. And he's doing it. And he does it through simple things. We, we think of something like godly Christian men and godly Christian women coming together, getting married, having children, living quiet lives, being faithful, growing in grace, coming together in a local church. And we think that's so insignificant. It means nothing. And God uses those very things to build his kingdom. The littlest things, the things that are mocked by our culture. Getting married, having children, being faithful to one another and serving God. Those are the things that God's using to 
overturn evil empires and man-centered nations. Christians are blessed experiencing God's favor, provision, and, and, and presence leading to, to spiritual fulfillment and, and flourishing. That's what's happening. We talk about the blessing, being blessed, God's blessed people. And there's nothing like the blessing of God. There's nothing like that. Receiving and trusting in Christ doesn't mean everything becomes easy, but it does, does bring the reality of peace, joy, rooted in Christ, and most importantly, the relationship that we get to enjoy with our Creator and our Lord. So we see this reward of, of persecution, and then we move on to the, the reality of persecution as we, we move forward and look at verse 11 here. The reality is every Christian will face some level of persecution. It's going to happen in your Christian walk or your Christian life. You will have to work really hard to not be persecuted in some way. You would have to put your light under a, a basket. You would have to not let anyone know you're a Christian. You would have to not live as a Christian. You would have to not think as a Christian or speak and talk as a Christian. It's just going to happen in your Christian life if you are faithful. Now, we pray that we won't see persecution on the level that some of our brethren see, but we will because Jesus promises this is a reality. It's coming, but it's not just here. We're not just taking one little verse out of the Beatitudes and, and, and trying to explode that out into this is just a reality. It's throughout the Scriptures. It's promises that Jesus uh, has given. It is what is uh, before us. We turn beginning. Let's look at a few of these. I'm going to just read through them. Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. Read verse uh, 22. Again, a recounting here of the Beatitudes. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Then John 15, the gospel according to John, chapter 15, turning to verse 18, as Christ is speaking here, If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the, world that I, remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. Flip over one chapter, John 16. Read just one verse, verse uh, 33. Again, Jesus speaking. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. We turn to Romans. Uh, back to the, uh, our New Testament continuous reading book at the moment. Romans chapter 8, we read just verse 17. And if children, speaking of uh, the reality here we have as God's adopted children, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Turn to one of the pastoral epistles, 2 Timothy. Uh, as Paul is writing to Timothy and giving him instruction as a young pastor, 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning in, in, in verse 10, this is going to be right before perhaps the passage that you're familiar with where he talks about the reality of how all God's word is, is God breathed. We've begun back up a little bit in chapter 3 to verse 10. You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystria, which persecutions I endured, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And then he goes on from there. And then just one more. First Peter. First Peter chapter 4, verse 14. There's this whole section here dealing with suffering as a Christian in chapter 4, but we're just going to read verse 14. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you're blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. So there's two, 
two things we want to put out to, to help give some context to this. Because it's very true that the persecution comes to Christians and that we're blessed for it. But there's, there's also what, what some Christians think is persecution, but it's not. So we want to make sure we clear this out real quick. Uh, it's not persecution when you're just abrasive and you're just a jerk and you think, well, you know, I could just, I could just be uh, the fly in everyone's ointment. I can be that grumpy person. We've probably all interacted with someone like this. Hopefully none of us are like that. But being a Christian or naming the name of Christ doesn't give us the right to not love our neighbors, not love one another, and to go around and be a jerk. And then when people push back, you say, ah, that's right, I'm being persecuted. Look at me. That's not, that's not what we're seeing here. That's not what we're reading. That's not what Jesus teaches. That's not what the Bible is talking about. This isn't a get-out-of-jail card for being a jerk or for breaking uh, God's law or the civil law. It's not, not to be used for Christians uh, to, to twist things that they might gain for themselves. It's about Christ. It's about Jesus. And then perhaps flip to the other side, the other issue that's grown in America and sadly we've exported out into the rest of the world is this, this unbiblical idea that, that when God saves you, you will never, ever suffer again. There will be no hardships. No one will oppose you. Life is going to be easy. In fact, you're going to be the healthiest you've ever been. Uh, everyone's going to want to be your friend. Life's going to be perfect. It's going to be like you're already in heaven. You either whether it's a, a full-blown, full-throated engagement and grabbing of the health wealth philosophy, or if it's just a, a low-level one that would believe that I don't have to pick up my cross daily by God's grace and move forward. I shouldn't expect there to be hardships, trials, or persecutions. I shouldn't expect the Lord to be working in me in the midst of these challenges to sanctify me and to grow me conform me to the image of Christ and prepare me for what it is he's called me to and for heaven itself. But the reality is Christians, they face, you face, hostility, reviling, false accusations for the sake of Christ and for the sake of the church. Ferguson writes, is this the reverse of what we would expect? Men and women who are poor in spirit, mourn for their sin, live lives of gracious meekness, longing for God's righteousness, show mercy to others, are pure in heart, and seek peace between God and man. With such people, not be welcomed with open arms? After all, these are the very men and women the world needs. The world in which we live assumes that it will welcome Christians with open arms until the first time it meets the genuine article. Until then... It is ignorant of its real response to the gospel. It assumes that it will be disposed to Jesus Christ and to God, but the scriptures tell us otherwise, for the world is in rebellion against God. So how will we respond? How will you respond when you come at whatever level that may be, whether it's just mocking, ridiculing, uh, whether it's being losing friends, losing job opportunities, or perhaps you find yourself at some day hitting up against a state that's looking to fine you, imprison you, whatever it may be. What will you do? What will be your response in the face of these things? Well, I pray, and I hope we're all praying, that by God's grace that that our response might be one of faithfulness, humility, trusting the Lord, that we would not, uh, as it were, turn around and attack those who attack us, but that we would allow the, the character of the Beatitudes to go forth in us as God's people, that we would be able to love our neighbors and most importantly love Christ in all things. That's how we respond. I hope that we're preparing for persecution because we know it's going to come at some level. Jesus says that. It's a reality. 
And I hope that we're preparing through the means of grace, word, prayer, sacrament, that we're praying and asking God to, to give us hearts and minds that are able to engage in these situations in ways that glorify Him and allow us to love Him and love those around us, that we're able to stand by His grace firm in our faith even when the world opposes us, even when we open our smartphones and our social media apps and, and everything we scroll through in the feed tells us that we're dumb, that we're a threat to everyone around us, and that we're the problem. Like we've seen throughout, sadly, church history and then even into the Old Covenant. Those who are in bondage to sin, those who are living in a sinful nature, in bondage to their father, the devil, the scapegoat is always God's people. How will we respond? And I hope we're not shocked when those who claim the name of Christ, at some point, we might even have them turning with the world against us, but that we would be prepared, that we might, by God's grace, submit to him and stand. For just a moment, we've seen the reward of persecution, the reality of persecution, and Take a, a moment or two to look at the response to persecution. Particularly, we're, we're focusing on verse 12 here. The response we see, this responding to persecution in verse 12, is one that's uh, a response that's, that's rejoicing. Rejoicing. And I think we see that uh, rejoicing in the face of persecution would be first a sign that, that God has worked in us and that we are His, and also that He is sanctifying us. That we are able to respond to situations that the rest of the world is baffled how we might do that with genuine joy in Christ and rejoicing even in the midst of tears. John Stott writes, how did Jesus expect his disciples to react under persecution? Well, in verse 12 we read, rejoice and be glad. We are not to retaliate like an unbeliever, not to sulk like a child, not to lick our wounds and self-pity like a dog, not just to grin and bear it like a stoic, still less to pretend we enjoy it like a masochist. What then? We are to rejoice as a Christian should rejoice and even to leap for joy. Why is this? Partly because Jesus added in verse 12, great is your reward in heaven. We may lose everything on earth, but we shall inherit everything in heaven. Not as a reward for merit, however, because the promise of the reward is free. Partly because persecution is a token of genuineness, a certificate of Christian authenticity. As Jesus goes on to say in verse 12, For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. I've heard interesting uh, read and heard and, and recorded lectures or sermons, uh, interesting interactions of, uh, of folks that, that we think, wow, that's a, that's a, that's a godly, godly person there. Uh, and they, they speak of the reality of, uh, of when we get to heaven, and we think about that, um, if we're really truly humble, we realize there's probably going to be a lot of people <laughs> a lot of people in front of us as far as if we were to think of it that way in, in, in closeness to the Lord and his throne. And when we read Revelation in the different places in the scriptures, what we see is, is the closest to Christ are his martyrs. That those who have dealt with the greatest persecution are those that are closest to him. As they responded by the power of the spirits in the midst of that persecution. We read in Acts 5, you remember, it was a long time ago, give or take. We spend our time together in Acts and we're moving through, but going back to Acts 5, verse, verse 40. Just a little bit of a reminder of the, the response that comes to persecution. Uh, we're not going to read the whole thing here. The apostles are arrested in Jerusalem and they're being persecuted by the powers that be, the Jewish authorities. So we're going to pick up there at the end of verse 40 in, in Acts 5. And this is the, the governing council. When they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Then they left the presence of the council rejoicing.
repenting that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. So, I mean, it's mind blowing. They, they re, they're, they're rejoicing in their suffering and their persecution for the sake of Christ. And yet we see rooted in that's an assurance of salvation and sanctification of the Lord at work uh, in us. Maybe for uh, clarification on the response there, if one of us or all of us were to be called in front of the, the governing authorities of civil government and, and we were being called because we were, we were breaking some uh, civil law that we shouldn't be doing, it had nothing to do with proclaiming the gospel, nothing to do with worshiping and and we were beaten and all these things were to happen to us, that maybe that's a good or bad thing depending on the, the context, but, but it would be wrong if we left rejoicing. We're being persecuted. No, 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 no. But if someday, for some reason, me or you or all of us find ourselves that we're being literally persecuted for the gospel, the proclaiming of it, the living of our Christian life, the worshiping of the Lord, and if the civil government turns and decides that they are going to attempt to silence us and beat us and to do these things, that by God's grace, may we leave that setting rejoicing. Rejoicing that there would be such a response because of Christ. And that the Lord would find us worthy to be able to be used by Him in such a way to bring that type of response. And that in that, even as we see in the New Testament and moving throughout, that even those who are persecuting, that maybe they would be like Paul. And that though they persecute us, that the Lord would even be using our witness in the midst of that persecution to bring them to faith and into the kingdom. Responding to persecution with rejoicing allows us to follow in the footsteps of the, the prophets with an, with an eye on heaven. Uh, as we read there at the end, as Jesus says, uh, we turn our attention to, to Hebrews chapter 11. And we get a picture of that in verse uh, 36. Hebrews chapter 11, verse, verse 36. And it's going on. And it talks to others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sewn in two. They were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, to whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And all these though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised since God had provided something better for us that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. We want to follow Christ. But there is that point where Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. So we look at the prophets, we look at those throughout church history, and as they have followed Christ faithfully, we hope to follow them. We have good examples to follow so we might walk the paths of these faithful ones. And persecution shows that we're true disciples of Christ. We talked about that. We see it in Matthew 10. It shows we're citizens of God's kingdom. Colossians 1 uh, points to that. But we're called as Christians to walk that ancient narrow path. And we walk the path lit by God's word, but we're walking a path that may be lit by God's word, but is worn by the saints that have gone before us. Those dear brothers and sisters that have walked by God's grace and faithfulness that same path. So that though it is lit, it is not a path that we're stumbling through and finding for the first time. But it is a well-worn, ancient path that God has been guiding His saints down, His people, for generations and generations. So how are Christians able to respond to persecution with rejoicing. We're able to do it because the Spirit's working in us, but we're ultimately able to do it because of Christ. So leave us with, with Revelation chapter 17, verse 14. Encouragement. For that is what Revelation is. It's a book of encouragement to the church. That God wins. Lord Jesus Christ wins. Revelation 17, verse 14. They will make war on the Lamb, and the Lamb will conquer them. For He is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those with Him are called 
and chosen and faithful. That's us, dear saints. We are the ones with the conquering lamb. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Oh God, we thank you for, for your word that, that opens to us truth that we might better understand you, your gospel. Oh Lord, we don't fully understand your ways. Sometimes they seem strange to us with our finite minds. So we ask that you would, would strengthen our weak faith and help us to understand and follow and by your grace to be faithful. Oh Lord, be with us in the midst of not just persecution, but in every moment of every day. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, let us respond as we put our voices together in song. We're going to read Christ, or we're going to sing Christ the Sure and Steady Anchor. It's on pages 11 and 12. So I invite you to stand if you're able as we all sing together. now the blessing, the Lord's benediction for His people. Now may the God of peace Himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ 